Good morning. Merry Christmas again. Oh, that was yesterday, but hope you did have a really, really Merry Christmas, really good time. Sort of the, we're, we're, we're gearing up for New Year's now, sort of the end of the year kind of reflection, and, and you may be uh, uh, thinking about all the stuff that you did last year, and, and maybe thinking about some of the stuff you didn't get done last year that you thought you might, and you, you, know, you know when the cowboy thinks about all the horses he'd like to ride, you know what he calls that? His buck at list. <laughs> yeah, I need bays, I just need help, I, I'm just telling you. Anyway, it's good to see you, it really is, and, and I wanna just pause a moment and celebrate. And uh, many of you, most of you were with us uh, Christmas Eve, which just seems like yesterday, but actually it was a day ago. Uh, and and we, had a, we had an amazing time together and amazing celebration and so many, many ways. Thank God for that. I just want to celebrate that, by the way, is the two-year birthday of our church. Uh, two years ago, Cowboy Church launched here, and uh, God's just been blessing us, and to have over 300 people in person, and uh, at least 87 devices that were watching us live, uh, and more that logged on later, and so just, just watching that happen in two years' time, oh wow, God is really, really that good. Tom's not that good. <laughs> I mean, he's good, but he's not that good. And I'm not that good, and nobody's that good. I mean, God is that good, and God has just done. Thanks, guys, for all of your help and participation, all that God is doing. God has just sent enormous blessing. And lots and lots of people are transitioning from knowing about God to really knowing God. That's so cool. That is so cool. Praise God. That's a lifelong process, by the way. I'm still, I'm still on that journey and, and figuring out more all the time. And God has just been blessing and helping us. I'll just also say something that not, not everybody sees, but it's just been rewarding, especially over the last month or so, to watch how people in our body are really acting like the body of Christ and really caring for each other and saying, hey, can I help? How can I help? Who can I help? And saying, here's someone that seems to maybe have a need that I could step up and help. And praying for each other and just helping each other. That's just, that's just uh, awesome to see. And as you know, we've not organized that. We've not, we try to be simple. We try to keep it simple. And God willing, we'll try to keep it simple. And, and yet people just responding to God's spirit in them and God's word around them. And it's just amazing. Praise God for that. Amen. Well, this morning we're back in the uh, Gospel of Luke and still in chapter 2. And um, if you've been keeping up, Jesus is born. Hallelujah. This is a huge event. This is a pivotal event. Uh, this is uh, almost 2022, the year of our Lord. 2021 today, 2000. The pivotal point of human history is Jesus Christ. It's how we know what day it is. It's how we know what year it is. It's around the coming of Jesus Christ. But he didn't come to create a calendar. He came to save us, to redeem us, to transform us, to change our lives. And, and we're, we're grateful for that. One of the, one of the things I talked about just, just Christmas Eve was the word incarnation, God in flesh, God with skin on, God among us. And it's more than just God becoming fully God and fully human. It is also that God gets involved with people. And as we journey through the book of Luke, we're going to see how God interacts with people. And today we're going to, we're, we're going to check in on a couple of older people. I'll, I'll, okay, I'll just say it, old people. Uh, uh, we're, we're going to check in on them. One, we know how old she was, and the other, we're not sure. Tradition says, but we don't know. Uh, so, so I'll just say they're older people. And these lessons are for all of us for any age, but, but if you're older, you, you, you may want to especially tune into that. Um, then we're going to go, in, next when we pick up in, in Luke, we're going to go to the childhood of Jesus, and we'll talk about some very younger people. But today we're going to talk about a couple of quite older people. It was, uh, it was in the temple, there were, there were two people who get involved in this. There's a guy named Simeon. We're not sure how old he is, but he had been prompted by the Holy Spirit to say, Simeon, you are not going to die until you have seen the Messiah, the Lord. Huh. 
So when you get that news, are you looking forward to the Messiah or not? See, uh, But Simeon was actually. He, he was this wonderfully devout person. In fact, we'll read something he says that I think is remarkable. But, but he, he's this wonderful, hope-filled guy who's looking for the glory of God, this devout person. And God has said, you're still going to be alive. You're still going to be here and physically see the Messiah, the Lord God, come. Then there's a woman whose name is Anna, and uh, the Bible spe specifies she's 84 years old. Um, and, and in that day, given that life expectancy, that was quite an anomaly. That was very old. There's a few of you in this audience today who will say, not, uh, not, 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 that's not old. Um, um, age is perspective, you know. Those of you who are 40, you know little kids think you're ancient. So I'm just saying, just, it's just perspective. Uh, but, but still, I, I'm saying she was, uh, she was this devout uh, servant of God. She practically lived day and night in the temple, and she was praying and fasting and going through all of this. And she as well lived in this expectation of the coming of the Messiah. And we're going to learn from these two people, their lives and their responses when they encounter Jesus for the very first time. Because it is on the eighth day. Jesus is eight days old at this story, and it is the Jewish ritual of eight days after birth, a male child was circumcised, and they brought him to the temple for this. And um, this, this happens in the back room of a hospital nowadays, if it happens for us, but it was a public ceremony for them. And um, so when they're bringing him to the temple is the first encounter, sort of the first public time for Jesus. And he encounters Simeon and Anna. And uh, I want to read you some words from each of them. And then we're going to come back and there's at least three lessons that I, that I want to draw from this. So let's go to the scripture. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of of Israel, that phrase, by the way, the consolation of Israel would would be understood as waiting for the Messiah, he who would come, the Lord of Israel, the Savior for Israel. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel, and catch this, this is huge. And the Holy Spirit was on him. All right. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. By the way, pause this a little bit. It's interesting, Jesus is the Son of God, God, and yet he submits to the religious and cultural rituals of his time. If I was God, I might say, you know, I'll just skip that. Um, but, but Jesus did that, went through that. Watch this. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now, watch this, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Interesting. He's saying, I can die now. And it'd be okay. I can go in peace. And he uses this phrase in this translation, at least, dismiss your service. Sort of like, I've been in class for quite a while now, and I can be dismissed. Now, I remember as, as, a, as a kid and a young person, um, all the way, I, I remember my second day in school coming to the root awareness that I didn't have a choice, that I had to do this. <sighs> I'm an impatient person. Dismissal was always my favorite part of the day. Are, are you with me? That, kept, that, that stayed with me throughout all of education. Dismissal, yes. I mean, I enjoyed some classes, and there, there was some stuff. You know, I, I actually enjoy learning, but, man, I've been sitting here for like 45 minutes to an hour. Seriously, who does that? Let's, let's move. Let's do something. And so dismissal was great. I've never actually just thought about it. You know, I've lived quite a while now, but I'm actually not in a hurry to be dismissed, to be honest. How about the rest of you? Uh, but, but Simeon has been waiting. God's been promising him this. Um, you're going to see the Messiah. You will not die. You see the Messiah. And instead of dreading that day, he's now saying, yeah, you can dismiss me now. 
I can be dismissed. I've done my thing. I've, I've, I've met this. But watch, watch what he does. Because you can dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. He's talked earlier about the salvation for Israel. Now he's talking about us, Gentiles, non-Jewish people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Uh, just before we go to the next verse, let me just say, put yourself in, you're Mary Joseph. I mean, already, you, you just, your mind's blown. You've had shepherds show up. Perhaps by this time you've had wise men. We're not exactly sure when they, when they uh, appear on the scene, but you, you, you've, <sighs> what's happening? What's going on? And, you, and you're a little puzzled because part of this just seems like sort of natural. This is just like what people do, have babies. And it's working out, and life's good, and so you sort of get tuned into that. And yet part of this is amazing. Like, oh, wow, who has angels show up and send shepherds? Hmm, nobody. Uh, you know, what's this going on? And, and so you, you're, you have this juxtaposition of amazing and miraculous and everyday normal we've been we've been a place with uh, sheep you know we've been there we got this wow this high and holy and this stinky we live in the midst of that are, are, are you getting this this is what the bible says to us ladies and gentlemen Sometimes we treat, we treat the Bible as if it's all high and holy. And the Bible says, no, there's sheep stuff here too. There, there's, there's, you, you, you walk through some of this stuff too. There's, there's this life. And in the middle of that, Jesus is there in both of those things. So he's in the temple, which is an ornate and amazingly beautiful thing. And he's going through this ceremony that's formal and religious. And, and, and yet here's this real life too. He's, he's, he's just involved in this. That's part of, that's, and, and his parents are just marveling at this, but the affirmation, I'll get back to it. All right, let's go to the next verse, and, and we're skipping verses up uh, in, in the passage to read here. This is now about Anna. So that, we, we read about, we were just reading about Simeon. Now we come to Anna, and she comes up to them at that very moment. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So, there's three lessons I want to I want to give about these three people, uh, these two people. And and again, these are older people. She's 84. He's whatever. Um, and so. If you're like me, Bonnie tells me that I should stop saying that I'm old because she says that's just not true. Um, it's a perspective issue. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I'll go with that. Um, uh, but for those of us who've had several birthdays, this is, I think, especially germane. But if you're uh, five instead of 85, um, listen up because there's some principles here too. For all of us, this is kind of we live, and, and the first one is this, that we should live in hope. Live in hope. These two people were such a blessing, such an honor, because they lived lives in hope. They were looking forward. I, I, can't, I can't really, I truly can't really overemphasize how important it is to live lives of hope. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I, if so, I would tell you that this is actually healthy for you. But that's beside my point today. I'm telling you this is holy for you. This is the right thing to do is to live in hope. And I'm also saying to you it's not an accident. You need to be intentional if you are a person of hope. So let me just suggest a few things about this, right? Because we live in a world that I think has a lot of hope, but we also have a lot of despair, a lot of gloom, a lot of doom. Hello? And, and it's easy to succumb to that. And the fact of it is, as you get older, there seems to be a tendency to drift into hopelessness 
more than hopefulness. And you look at this younger generation as a, oh boy, and you forget how unbright you were as a young person. Uh, and, you, and you think, well, what are we coming to? And I'm thinking, I remember me, and I think we're coming to a better place here. I think we, I think we got some really good people coming on here compared to some of the people I hung out with. Um, um, are, are you with me? But I'm just saying, there tends to be that, and then you listen to bad news, and we feed ourselves, and sometimes when you get up and you're achy and grumpy, and all of that tends toward hopelessness rather than hopefulness. And you buy something and it says it'll last you for, you know, we, a few years back we had our roof hailed and the, and the appraiser was telling me we get this and it'd be a, I think a 40 year guarantee or whatever. <laughs> and he was a young guy and um, we started thinking about it. And I said, uh, I'm betting that'll do me. <laughs> he said, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> He said, yeah, I think it's the last roof you'll need, probably. <laughs> and and, and you, you see, you start, you start looking at that window closing, right? And, and it, it tends to sap your hope. So let me talk about that a little bit. First of all, this is, this is an old adage, but it, it certainly works. Feed your hope, starve your fears. Feed your hope, starve your fears. Let me go to the starve your fears side of it. Uh, um, sometimes I have to quit listening to certain people with whom I agree because they feed my fears, not my hope. They keep telling me how bad things are and going to be. And I've already heard that. I don't try to deny reality. I don't try to wall off from saying, well, I just don't want to hear bad stuff anymore. Every once in a while you need to hear bad stuff because some stuff is bad. But, but, I don't need a constant drip of that or a constant flow of that or a constant deluge of that. So I would say to you, watch your inputs. Watch if they tend your fear and doubt, limit that. Feed what tends toward hope and joy. Amen? Second, I will say this, their hope is rooted Please understand, these are the people we, chapter 2 starts with in the time of Caesar Augustus. All the world was to be taxed again. High taxes, a cruel and whimsical dictator. Under him was Herod, who was a perverted human being, who was just a despicable person, who was whimsical and capricious and just killed people because it was fun. And, and he, he was just a horrible, awful leader. And they lived under that. Many of their uh, chief religious leaders were corrupt and politically motivated. And all of their setting, boy, life was not good. And yet they lived in hope because God is saying, I'm sending a Messiah. I'm sending a Savior. I'm sending one who's going to bring you light. I, they use words like salvation, redemption, light, hope, blessing. Their hope, they are not only just feeding their hope, but they are grounding their hope and they're feeding it on a reality that's bigger than stuff around us. I gotta tell you this, if your hope is in the next election, good luck with that. Now, I'm sort of hopeful for the next election but my hope is not grounded in that. Because even if it turns out the way I want it to turn out, I won't be happy for more than two years, I'm pretty sure. Hello? Anybody? Are you, are you with me? If your hope is just in that, uh, your, your, your hope meter is going to go up and down and probably tend toward down. Um, if, you're, if your hope is in the market, you're going to have this. If your hope is in you, are, are you getting a hint here? If your hope is on this kind of stuff, I, I'm looking at some very good people today, and, and I, I don't mean to be, hope, and I trust you, and, 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 but, but if your hope is in people, sooner or later, they'll disappoint you. Good people will disappoint you, let alone bad people. They'll really disappoint you. Hello? Anybody lived? I'm just saying, this, this is, their hope was in God. 
Their hope was saying, in spite of our politics and in spite of our, our rulers and in spite of our systems and in spite of our structures, our hope is rooted that God promised us he's sending us a redeemer, a Messiah, who isn't just good, he's perfect. And he will redeem us. Now, I'm not a hopeless person. In, if I'm, I'm happy and proud to be a citizen of the United States of America, and I'm not giving up and don't think we're done, and, and I'm not hopeless about that, and God's blessed us, and I don't want to paint a bad picture here worse than it is, but neither is that my hope, because sooner or later, ladies and gentlemen, this will go away too. Hope is not in this. Our hope is in God, the almighty God. He's the sustainer. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. And when you have a foundation of hope in God, <laughs> ain't nothing going to move that. He is God. Part of what Simeon says in one of his is the sovereign Lord, he says, sovereign Lord. You're above everything. Sovereign Lord, you got this. My hope is in you. So these were people of hope. Ask yourself this question. Am I a person of hope? Or am I a person of fear? You can probably say yes, because you probably have both of those. That's a fact. I get that. But ask yourself emphasis questions. Am I, do I have more hope than fear or more fear than hope? Do I need to starve my fear and feed my hope? Do I need to advance that? The answer is probably yes. You need to strengthen hope. Let's go to the next one. And that is that these were also people who blessed now, again, this is absolutely important. This is, this is amazingly important. And again, at any age group, please understand if you're 16 and you encounter someone at six, they think you're really grown up and really something and old. And if you bless them, it's a really huge deal. If you're 60 and encounter someone at 16, <laughs> they think you're really old. And, and if you're 84, as Anna was, and you know, whatever. I'm just saying, this is any age group, but I would say especially for those of us who've had a bunch of birthdays, blessing people becomes really important. And, and in the words of Scripture, Simeon, when he took up the baby, he blessed them. He blessed Mary and Joseph. And there was there were some real value, some real virtue there. And, and two things that he did by that, and he and Anna as well, they both did. They encouraged and affirmed. We think Mary was a teenage mom. And all of this is just totally overwhelming. Wow. And she's here. And here are these two older, godly, revered people who come alongside and say, oh, wow, I've seen the Lord, the Messiah. Here's this eight-year-old baby. And my hope is fulfilled. God, I can go to heaven, Simeon says. Now, you can dismiss me now because I've seen it. Wow. God, you're here. And Mary's going, excuse me, hello, whoa. I mean, she's heard the voice of the angel way back, you're going to have the Messiah. But through all of this, like, really, really, did that, did that happen? And now she gets this affirmation. But they also give the encouragement, this is the salvation, this is the redemption. Here, here's something that's really happened. Ladies and gentlemen, we have so much capacity to encourage each other. And it's so important for us to look at those opportunities to encourage each other. And as one of my rather consistent prayers is, God, please don't help me, please help me not to go past anyone who needs encouragement, but especially young people who need encouragement. Help me, God, to pass that on and encourage them. Because some of them think, because I've lived a long time, I know stuff. Now, I will tell you that getting old doesn't make you wise. Having birthdays doesn't make you smart. If you're smart, you get smarter with birthdays. If you're not smart, you don't get smarter with birthdays. It's just that way, okay? I'm just, it's just cowboy logic, but I'm just telling you. So, so age doesn't necessarily, but there's people who think you are just because you're old. You know, you got great stuff. They think, oh, wow, he must be wise. Well, I don't want to waste that. If they think that, I want to give them wisdom. See, whatever God has given you, give that as a gift of bless, encourage, affirm them. It, it, it's so ask yourself, am I a person of hope? Am I an encouraging person? Am I a person who gives affirmation? 
Because here's what I think people catch themselves, I've done it, I, I catch myself thinking encouraging thoughts about someone, but I just never verbalize it, just never say it. Well, guess, that did me some good, but it didn't help them at all. Because I'm betting they can't read my mind. Sometimes they don't understand it when I say it, let alone if I just think it, hello? But affirmation, bless them, help them, bless them. Let's go to the next one. And that is, these were people who kept the big picture in mind. They, they looked past the temporary, which was the Roman Empire. That seemed invincible, impregnable, unmovable. And they looked past that to see the kingdom of God. They looked past the deplorable conditions of Israel at that point, under the tyranny of Rome, under leaders like Herod and others, uh, Pilate and others that were just corrupt politicians. They looked past that to say, there is a God. They kept the big picture in mind. They kept what Jesus was coming for in mind, for redemption, for salvation. I just think, by the way, that maturity should help us understand the big picture. Now I get caught up like a lot of you that sometimes little, little stuff seems like the whole world. And it's nice to step back and say, you know, I've seen this happen. I've seen this wave about three times. You know, we'll be okay. Just give it a couple years, we'll be good. Um, and, and, you know, do you remember when you were, let's say six, and, and your mom fed you something that you didn't like? I mean, she had, for me it was peas, I hate peas. I still hate peas. I just hate peas. There's no reason for peas to be, but I hate peas. If I ever come to your house for dinner and you serve peas, I'll be polite and nice, but I won't eat them. I'll just tell you that right now. That just Life's too short to fill it with peas. Kale is right close, but I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, I, but, but, but when I was six, see, if I come to your house and you serve me peas, I understand. I just got to try to be nice and polite, and I'll get over this, and I don't have to eat them, and I'll live happily ever after. When I was six, they made me eat peas. That is the end of the world. This is the whole thing, see. Like, my, my world's just coming to an end right now. Now that I'm many multiples of six, I'm thinking, bad five minutes. I'll make it. My wife every once in a while slips peas in some salad or something or other and tricks me. And I've eaten a pea by mistake. <laughs> not happy. But I'm not devastated either. Do you start to get the picture? It's the bigger picture. Got it? Got it? I have enough years to say, not the end of the world. And so what I'm saying to you is if you've had a few birthdays, let's go to the next slide, please. It's good to be able to remember that and remind people, not the end of the world. There's more important things. There's bigger stuff here. Remember and remind, you're going to be okay. There's coming a day without peas. You'll be okay. There's coming a day when you can decide what you want to eat. You probably still won't make good choices, but you, you can do that. There's coming a day. See, and you can remember and remind. This is, get your mind off peas for a while, please. This is something bigger than this. There's coming a day, they're saying, when Jesus is here. And I remember the fact that God is in control. And I want to remind you that there's a good day coming. Amen? So, these are first encounters with Jesus, eight days old. And these two older people encounter him. They live in hope. They bless, affirm, encourage. And they keep the big picture. And they remember that. And they remind Joseph and Mary. What an amazing blessing for these young first-time parents. We're good. We're in God's will. Center of God's will. You've encountered Jesus. He's alive. Be that kind of person, will you? Let's pray. Father, first of all, thanks again for sending Jesus. Wow. We celebrate again. It's a wonderful, wonderful birth of our Lord Jesus. Now we encounter him. Help us to live in hope. 
live in hope that's grounded in you, God, and what you're going to do. Help us to be people who will bless others, encourage them, affirm them, build them up, and help us, God, to keep your big picture in mind so that we know the things that are really important, the things that really matter. God, I ask your blessing on each one of us today and pray, God, that you would help us just to enter this new year with hope more than fear. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Happy New Year.